Good morning, friends, and welcome our second speaker for the day, CS Sanjay Kamani. Kamani ji is a practicing chartered accountant and a senior partner in an MSMN company, and he is working after the. He was working with IDB earlier, and now he is and he is working with MSMN as a senior partner. He has a very rich experience in the audit of financial services industry, encompassing our almost entire gamut of the financial service industry: like regulator, stock exchange, banks, life insurance, general insurance, reinsurance companies, mutual fund, NBFC, housing finance companies, investment bankers, stock brokers, etc. He has also addressed various seminars on bank audits and other audits, and at presently he is also a director on the LIC Housing Finance Board. With these words, may I request Sanjay ji to please. start a session thank you thank you chintan bhai and thanks everybody to uh, have been able to make it on the sunday evening and particularly when the mood all around is uh, not so uh, good all around we have all been uh, maybe since last few days have been only hearing about the covid uh, 19 so this is a good change for everybody of course uh, Yeah, we we just forget which is the working day today and yesterday when chintan bhai uh, called me up and told me that there is a uh, seminar tomorrow then only i realized okay baba tomorrow is sunday so i don't know how you have been spending time uh, <clears throat> during this lockdown period but i will look at uh, the way i will look at is that this is a god sent opportunity for all of us to maybe enhance our uh, knowledge and also complete whatever pending work which as he said our personal work has always been coming to the last uh, priority now coming to the topic which has been given to me the topic is on the early warning signal uh, uh, on frauds in the banking sector banking sector now <coughs> Uh, why this is something which is very very important as we know and all of us must have been uh, reading in the newspaper suddenly you find there is lot of spike in the frauds which has been uh, reported in the banking sector now has this fraud happened uh, suddenly probably no the identification is something which has taken uh, a lot of time the expectation from the uh, auditors from the general uh, uh, stakeholders including the regulators has been that the auditor uh, is required to maybe detect these frauds in time having said that our asset uh, 240 is very clear which uh, cast the obligations which are there uh, uh, on us whether we are supposed to be the audit procedure what we are adopting whether it is supposed to be designed for detecting the fraud or not so before we get into the fraud and our responsibility i'll maybe just take uh, two minutes and how we finally unless we know uh, how the frauds are being uh, or uh, it's happening the and the what are the signals which are present in the bank the, uh, otherwise we will not be able to detect those in time and which will lead to an a fraud which is being committed even though our sa 240 is very clear that the our procedures are not designed to detect fraud but the way the environment is the way the regulators have the expectation from the uh, auditing profession i think we may get into the trouble so it is all uh, for all of us it is necessary when we are doing the bank audit that we have your eyes and ears open now when we uh, design our uh, <coughs> the uh, audit program or audit checklist now as per uh, uh, asset 240 what is the most important in this is that uh, uh, when we are doing risk assessment of any uh, the material misstatement in the case of the bank which is the most important area where there the risk lies so generally the experience has been that the most of the frauds and the uh, when i am saying not in terms of number but in terms of value in terms of value the frauds do occur in the advances and generally the frauds are not perpetrated by the uh, bank but it is the fraud on the bank maybe there have been instances where the bank uh, staff is in collusion with the borrower and then there are other types of frauds where the the fraud is being committed uh, on the deposit side but considering that all of us would be doing audit of an a branches which are advances heavy so maybe to my mind when we do the risk assessment and of uh, uh, something going wrong or materially misstated it could be the, uh, the probability or the possibility of uh, advances related frauds not getting detected in time 
what is that which we are supposed to be doing as per i said 240 uh, so professional skepticism is something which we are supposed to be keeping in mind of course that goes without saying for any audit but more so when we are dealing with the bank but considering that the time which is being made available to us to perform the audit is very very limited and in the uh, particularly this year when everything is uh, closed and banks are working so when we are closed banks are working the moment the uh, this lockdown is lifted every bank will start calling the auditor and saying that now it is uh, lifted now you complete it in next two days time three days time so generally many a times we as a branch auditor have been able to do a lot of work before the uh, year end in unfortunately this time one uh, number one the appointment has got delayed number two before we could actually start start the uh, audit this lockdown has happened so uh, despite there being a lot of pressure uh, from the there could be a lot of pressure from the bank in terms of early completion of the audit and our inability to respond to them in time our responsibility it does not in any way is lowered particularly when it comes to the uh, detection of i will not use the word detection of the fraud but maybe early sighting of the fraud or the, uh, early warning signal relating to the fraud now what type of frauds which are uh, taking place in the banking industry so maybe we'll go one by one by uh, deal with the slide how do i do this So the frauds in the banking industry is basically uh, are two types one which is being done on the bank second is fraud in the bank in the bank is always by the insider outs fraud on the bank is by the outsider frauds inside the bank are not very significant in terms of uh, value because the probability of those frauds getting detected is very very high but since we are dealing with early warning signal i thought my maybe spare spend a, a half a minute on that so these kind of frauds do take take place uh, in uh, the banking system which is mainly because of uh, two reason one there is a big uh, lo lo lot of haste in getting things done and because of the workload people uh, do tend to share password of each other sharing of password in many of the banks has been very very common which leads to lot of fraud which are taking place and there has been fraud around the uh, uh, i would say the cash transactions so the uh, type of frauds which happens in the cash transactions uh, is basically i mean there has been instances which has been reported to the reserve bank of india where the cashiers have been uh, running some kind of an intraday uh, cash lending facility to maybe some of the traders which are uh, located close to the bank so when the bank opens in the morning the cash is intact the cashier uh, passes on the uh, cash to the uh, let us say the uh, the person or the trader who is in conniving with the cashier and before the close of the day cash is again deposited in the bank so when uh, cash is being checked internally by let us say the higher authority or the branch manager both at the time of opening at the time of the closing of the branch cash tallies but during the day it doesn't tally now how as a auditor uh, we, we can do that so the easiest thing to do that uh, is counting the cash during the uh, uh, course of the day but that's easier said than particularly if the branch is uh, uh, very deposit heavy branch where there is huge rush of the customers now <clears throat> we will have to uh, find out a way by which we are able to do that uh, uh, during the course of the day so that we are able to uh, avoid or uh, able to detect if there are any such things which are happening uh, uh, around the cash then i'll come to the fraud on the bank maybe we'll deal it uh, little later that's something which is there being dealt in detail so we'll come to that now why people commit fraud the single most reason for committing the fraud is uh, number one the greed and number two the need in that order 
greed leads to the larger uh, i mean the the propensity of committing the fraud and in terms of value is very very high and need is some sometimes forces the uh, person to commit the fraud so these are the two major reason why uh, the fraud is committed and when the why people do the fraud because if they have uh, they feel that the fair uh, they uh, either they are not uh, going to get caught or they don't fear that even if i get caught i am not ashamed about it then as i said the uh, second thing when particularly the need arises he feels no it is harmless what is that uh, giving the example of the cash lending during the day he said what harm i have done due to the bank the cash was there in the morning cash is there in the evening i have just helped a friend who is uh, in the need and in any case the bank as and when i need the cash he is able to do it and this is how the uh, cashier try to justify the fraud now what can lead to a fraud so does it mean that the bank do not have any con uh, control systems banks have a robust control system but any system has lot of loopholes and that is where the insider and the outsider uh, can exploit the loopholes so there are internal control systems where there are uh, certain weaknesses the example could be you have maybe multiple systems which are working in the uh, bank and one uh, all systems are not talking to each other uh, digitally somebody has to maybe do some kind of an a batch posting from one system to another it can lead to a, and the internal guy can definitely uh, <coughs> take advantage of that then poor security of asset maybe that's something which i'll uh, leave that aside lack of fear of detection we have already uh, considered unclear policies is also something which sometimes uh, 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 lead to i would say frauds in the banks mainly because if uh, policies are not very clear to the, just to give an uh, example now if you are lending against uh, if there is a cash credit account and the lending against receivable is also there and margin is not there and the policy is silent on whether to grant uh, drawing power against the receivables from the group companies now if there is no policy or the policy is silent on that then what is going to happen is that the uh, the branch will end up uh, lending against that because maybe the branch also wants to take an advantage of uh, the situation and uh, want to oblige the borrower and everybody is working uh, for the target and uh, if the larger client so sorry somebody is saying something hello sir please continue hello? sir please continue sir yeah okay so the fraud typically has uh, uh, every fraud cycle typically has uh, three uh, 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 three steps that, that i'll deal it in the next slide and <clears throat> finally at howsoever smart the fraudster is going to be the winning streak is always disrupted it is only at some point of time the fraudster will get caught now we as a auditor has a responsibility or uh, maybe our professional judgment may come to a, uh, the rescue of the oddity if you are able to detect it, it earlier okay. so this is the cycle of uh, fraud the first is initiation or the loophole di discovery as i said the, this is where the insider as well as the outsider plays a role so i'll give you one example which i came across uh, in a bank particular every bank has a end of day procedure 
and during end of the day procedure the system do not give you a live balance and uh, in a bank when they migrated from one system to another system what happens is but the transactions are taking place throughout the night even if there is an a uh, 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 your closing is happening <coughs> EOD process is on the system is working. We are able to make payment through uh, ATM. We are able to make payment through UPI and all those things. So for that, what they do is they keep the data uh, in a separate server where this data gets updated. In in an example, uh, in a particular instance, one of the uh, particular type of accounts were never migrated to that. So what was happening is that when uh, the migration did not took place and when the old data was going to that uh, server from where during the process of uh, this EOD customer was able to access the account. So one of the NRI customer probably by chance he uh, saw that when he withdraw the money, withdraw the money at around uh, maybe 11, 30, 12 o'clock uh, midnight. He, uh, he could withdraw the money, but his account was not debited. He went uh, and checked the account online. The account was not debited. Next day also he uh, saw the account. Account is not debited. He waited for two days time. He find that this account is not getting debited. Again, after two days, he went, withdrew some amount. He still saw that his account has not been debited. Then he realized that there is a uh, loophole in the banking system. And then he started uh, doing this on a weekly basis, regular basis and he could withdraw the amount almost about two crores from his account because in case uh, in ATM withdrawal there is a limit. Uh, I think there was a particular limit of some fifty thousand rupees per day, and he was not doing it on a daily basis. Otherwise, he would have got. Uh, so he could withdraw roughly about two crores, and this came to a light only at the time of quarterly closing when the. <coughs> books of accounts with the subsidiary laser and this laser was being re uh, reconciled then the bank realized because there is a fraud which has already taken place now this is a uh, one example where the loophole was discovered by the outsider similarly insiders and particularly people who are very smart at that they are the one who are able to uh, discover the loopholes and depending on as i said the need or the greed they they exploit the situation <coughs> And then based on that, uh, once they start uh, doing that, then obviously uh, uh, th that is something which we call is a m m uh, winning. And they also try to cover this through various means. So as I said, uh, had this uh, transaction come to the notice or any transaction come to the notice immediately, the uh, perpetrators would not indulge into the front because they are not too sure that they, whether this get caught. But as, as it is said that, uh, <coughs> So it is only a matter of time before the perpetrators get caught. The same thing is being explained uh, maybe in a different manner. But the difference is when it starts, it starts with the very uh, small amount. The amount will keep uh, increasing, increasing, increasing. And when it goes, let us say to disproportionate at the fourth uh, 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 the stage is the one where the, you hit a uh, wall of disruption and that is where the fraud gets uh, uh, come to the surface. So the, with the case in example could be everybody is aware of the Nirav Modi fraud which has taken place in the uh, BNB where the fellow has been doing it for last many years until the time uh, the amount did not let us say balloon to almost two billion dollars it never came to the mind. Now <clears throat> Next slide is the one where I'm going to deal with where uh, ideally where the auditor should come in. <clears throat> now at the first stage or the second stage or the third stage is the one where if the auditor is able to detect the fraud by uh, I'm not saying when we do the audit procedure or audit procedures are aligned to uh, detect the fraud or we are supposed to be doing the forensic audit that's not something which is expected out of us at the same time professional skepticism demand that we should keep our eyes and ear open and i can tell you the experience that during the course of the statutory audit i have come across many instances instances 
where the fraud has taken place of course during the course of the state audit we uh, don't do not classify the account as fraud because for you to be able to classify the account as a fraud the audit the kind of procedure which is required to be carried out by you is not something which you as auditor will be able to do it but you can definitely flag those issues to the management and what is there in the hands of the auditor is only to the classify the account as npa and reporting it to the audit committee as well as the regulator as a potential fraud because as auditors i i have seen that uh, some some people maybe go a little overboard and try to classify the account as fraud that's something which is uh, uh, which can turn out to be quite challenging because the moment classified as fraud various regulatory authorities law enforcement agencies bank has to uh, report that matter and when they come to that they find that based on this limited procedure you have classified the account as fraud because we did not have sufficient information third party information before we classify the account as fraud we don't do investigation during the course of the audit we are only supposed to be getting the reasonable assurance and to we are always to detect Suppose reasonable assurance, and that to be our role is error and not to detect fraud. If you come across something, then uh, your advice to of out like check cash and cash. Should we report? Yes, we should report. But otherwise, advances related fraud is something uh, which I think we should not uh, get into reporting them as a fraud. But we should uh, sound the management, uh, notify to the audit committee as well as the regulator that these are the critical issues which we have observed. which uh, appears to be an fraudulent transaction which warrants maybe a detailed forensic audit and we should leave it at that and as far as the asset classification is concerned depending on uh, the implications of that the one can take a call <coughs> so fraud risk involving it so as i said the risk assessment is required to be done so there are two types of risk which in any, every branch uh, which is very very important so many of the uh, internal frauds are being done uh, because of the loopholes in the it systems and external fraud is because of the advances so these are maybe some of the uh, uh, i think all of us are aware uh, uh, about the first one uh, swift is not integrated with the cbsc i am referring to the pnb perpetrators can easily send letter of understanding to the overseas bank so that's what i am referring to fraud on digital payment system this is something which is on rise and as, as auditor can we do something it is something which is difficult to do uh, detect it or give any kind of an early warning signal sitting at the branch this kind of an activity probably can be done only at the uh, uh, i and most of the time this comes to the notice of the branch only when the fraud has taken place so maybe i'll skip on that now there are few detection technique uh, for early warning signals which are there so i'll come to what are the early warning signals so but since i'm dealing with it maybe i thought i'll uh, use that i'm dealing with Uh, so uh, which is again being done at the uh, maybe it department it is not being done at the branches so basically the data analytics uh, and analytics are being used to uh, uh, maybe detect an uh, 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 an abnormal behavior of the uh, person so generally if somebody has been continuously regularly at uh, every 10 uh, 10 minutes or 5 minutes somebody is withdrawing the money from the atm then the the data analytics is able to detect it immediately they will further stop the transactions immediately so those kind of processes are in place so there are both the types of processes are in place one is something which is preventive some one is something which is detective now reserve bank of india has come out with uh, uh, two circulars so the first circular is for a framework for dealing with loan fraud it is uh, dated 7th may 2015 and there is another signal uh, circular which is there on the uh, on 1st of july 2016 which is master direction on fraud classification and reporting by the commercial banks and select 
select FIEs. There, the Reserve Bank has clearly listed out 42 early warning signals of the fraud. Now, those 42 early warning signals of the fraud has been listed in this presentation in detail. And uh, I have tried to categorize all of them into various categories. So one is relating to the operations of the account, then the concealment or falsification of the documents, diversion of funds. Most important thing which can lead, uh, I mean, uh, 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 is the uh, diversion of funds is something which we have been hearing time and again. And that is where the loss to the bank has uh, occurred the most. Then issues in the primary collateral security, intergroup concentration of the transactions, regulatory concerns. Now, what I'll do is instead of going through uh, each of these kind of transactions, see, <coughs> because there are 42, I have listed down, maybe I, I, I'll uh, leave the presentation. Uh, you can go through that. But maybe I'll share some practical experience which uh, uh, during the course of the uh, audit I have come across how we should be able to I will not use the word detect the fraud but uh, we should be able to do the some kind of the red flag okay I, I will also mention there is something called red flag red flag accounts so red flag accounts are the accounts where the any account which is more than 50 crores and uh, where the bank is suspecting a fraud they are supposed to be first classifying the account as a red flag account and after the trade flag account it is being classified as a red flag account they will go for the forensic audit and depending on the outcome of the forensic audit uh, <coughs> the account is classified as a fraud so our role is basically in this uh, bank branch audit is to enable the bank to reflect certain accounts if we feel that no there are certain fraudulent uh, uh, activities which are going on <clears throat> now since uh, I, I want to deal with the advances related uh, uh, fraud there are few uh, maybe the signals which uh, I have come across maybe which I'll uh, highlight uh, in this <clears throat> so and maybe I'll share few of the examples also So the signal simulating from the management payroll and audited financial statements. So these are something which I have come across while auditing the branch books of accounts. So there are too many changes in the key management personnel or below that. So it could be CFO, could be company secretary, could be a person below the CFO. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that is something which is uh, uh, can lead to a fraud, but then we need to uh, be very careful whenever there are too frequent changes in that because we being an insider, the fellow is able to sense it and uh, doesn't want to get uh, into, let us say, any loop or the wave. And particularly if the fraud is being done at a level which is higher than their level. Directors, editors, and the other directors, public past association. So this, I, I, I'll give you an example. I, I have come across instances. So you have uh, in, intercompany transactions or the related party transactions, which the banks generally do not fi uh, finance. In every sanction letter, we will find that the bank does not grant any drawing power against the re receivables, which is uh, from the group companies. Now. <coughs> When you look at the uh, borrow, uh, borrower's bank statement, you find that there are frequent uh, transactions with certain entities and particularly large uh, value transactions. So what we generally do it wherever, okay, to begin with, I think I missed the most important point. Do we do this in all these transactions? The answer is no, because there is no point in doing this in all the transactions, con considering that we only have three, four days time to complete the audit and the number of accounts could be very large. Okay. <clears throat> so what we generally do is we only pick up SMA account. So we can pick up SMA 1, SMA 2, start with the SMA 2 account, then we come to the SMA 1. Generally, we do not get into the uh, accounts which are already classified as an NPA only from the uh, fraud perspective. We mainly look at 
from the uh, provisioning perspective because the delinquency has already got recognized now we need to see whether the provision which is required to be made is adequate or not so uh, generally what we do is we scan all sma1 and sma2 and we don't take sma1 or sma2 only at the end of the reporting period generally what we should be doing is we should be looking at sma1 sma2 of uh, the whole of the year this report is available on a weekly basis if we scan through that report we will realize that which are the accounts which are uh, maybe has been facing some kind of an a cash flow mismatch or stress during the year and accounts which have been frequently falling into sma1 sma2 is something which we uh, select and then we look at when you go through the financial statement of the borrower then uh, these are the things which we should so first first is as i said frequent changes in this then the common directors now many a times the borrower do not disclose the common directors uh, to the bank so we use the publicly available information just to see where all the, the person is a director and in his company whoever is a director where all those people are directors so that has in few instances we have come across that there has been some kind of an circuitous transactions which people have been indulging into and the, without the bank knowing that these are all related parties so that could be another area where uh, what we can look at uh, wherever we have an sma1 or sma2 account then the remuneration of the uh, cfo and the service others in the same industry or the same hierarchy wherever we find that the remuneration of the cfo is very high as compared to uh, let us say the other people uh, in the organization and this information is available now that in the director's report so that again is some sometimes cause of the concern coupled with if the account is already sma1 and sma2 so then we uh, try to go little deeper into this that uh, then we want to tick, uh, uh, check all the tick boxes then the promoters remuneration versus which is the senior employees remuneration this is something which i am sure all of us are uh, aware is very common particularly in the private limited companies where maybe employees are being paid a reasonable salary maybe 25 lakhs 50 lakhs but when you look at the directors remuneration the directors remuneration may be 10 lakhs 50 lakhs whatever such a small amount which is lower than the remuneration which is being paid to the employees now this is something which again uh, is an uh, it gives a clear indication that the directors are uh, trying to siphon up the money because otherwise it cannot happen the directors are being paid less than the uh, uh, let us say their other uh, key employees which could be cfo or uh, uh, coo or the company secretary increase in place of share by the promoters that again gives uh, a, a does it lead to any uh, fraud the answer is no but as i said to go back uh, why people commit fraud is one is the need second is the greed so because there is a need uh, he has been increasing the uh, uh, he has been pledging the shares more and more and his interest meter is on there is a need for him to stop that and that's something which may lead him to commit fraud so that also we look at okay is there any these all are something which are i'm talking about is uh, maybe in the large company or the listed entities so this information is available again in the public domain and generally what we have been doing is we have been uh, looking at only publicly available information we don't ask for the additional information uh, from the borrower because generally that's something which we should uh, avoid unless something which is mandatorily required to be asked because if you uh, unless you have something which can uh, you, you are able to come to some conclusion that there is something wrong if we start asking for the information which the bank is in routine course not supposed to be asking it will only put the borrower on the guard so we generally try to uh, take uh, publicly available information and now uh, with the uh, uh, digital going everywhere we are able to get uh, most of the information sudden sharp movement in the stock price i don't have to tell you that then low fixed asset turnover and low return on equity now this is something uh, is very very important for all of us we we have been doing audit of the uh, non bank clients also and uh, we we deal with the businessmen day in day out 
no businessman would like to uh, invest money in uh, in uh, anything or any venture where it is uh, not able to give him the sufficient return to give an example if the return on equity is let us say 8% then the businessman will not do that for the simple reason he said boss 8% of the bank pe laga dunga yaar mere ko yahan pe itna sab janjat karne ki zarurat kyu hai so these are again some of the uh, similarly low uh, fixed asset turnover so if uh, somebody is putting a plant and if it is not able to give a, a sufficient turnover the promoter or the, uh, the owner is not going to invest money in that of course there are abras abrasions uh, in this i am not saying every such instance whatever i have discussed so far is uh, lead to a fraud there could be genuine cases also but then we need to tick box uh, uh, check all these tick boxes then another point which is statutory auditors fee we say with other similar size company this is something i have seen is a barometer i have been using i don't know how far uh, this is relevant i really don't know but i can only share my own experience the entities which has a very low audit fee contrary to the perception entities with a large audit fee but i would say the entities with a very low audit fee have the more risk uh, in terms of uh, uh, all these uh, check boxes i find lot of issues are there in those entities and in fact i'll i'll give you one specific uh, example in one of the uh, uh, borrowers account we were auditing the bank had granted a limit of about 75 crores they were it, it was a jeweler and when i looked at uh, uh, the financial statement so the remuneration to the directors were 1 lakh 20000 audit fee was 10000 rupees turnover was 600 crore rupees bank limit uh, was uh, 75 crore rupees now looking at all these this was a clear indication that was if is enough uh, such a large turnover who is going to be doing the audit in 10000 rupees why the director is going to be working at 1 lakh 20000 rupees when you don't get 10000 rupees uh, peon nahi aata ya 10000 rupees mein bombe mein so uh, that actually was the indication which leads us to do maybe little more deep diving to the account and finally we came to the conclusion that the borrower uh, has been uh, raising fictitious invoices and by which he has uh, inflated the turnover which has resulted into maybe the bank giving the uh, uh, very high working capital limit so did we classify the account fraud as i said earlier we didn't classify the account as fraud we classified the account as npa at the same time we wrote a letter to the audit committee of the bank and also uh, marked a copy to the, uh, the there is a central fraud cell uh, in the reserve bank of india located which is at uh, bangalore so we also reported the matter to that that this appears to be an a suspected fraud which needs to be a detailed forensic audit needs to be done subsequently when the bank did the forensic audit, uh, audit obviously the it uh, turned out to be fraud <clears throat> so these are the indicators which uh, generally when you look at in isolation may not give you anything but when taken together these can throw lot of uh, uh, light on the whether there could be in a fraudulent uh, transactions which are uh, going on this and unfortunately what is happening Uh, in the banking industry the moment a fraud is uh, declared why it is so that the fraud uh, the account uh, the provision is required to be at 100% because the bank is required to report the fraud to the local police authority police will do their own uh, investigation at their own pace and time so by that time uh, the probability of the amount getting recovered is uh, very low and that's the reason reserve bank asks every bank to make provision 100% of course if uh, depending on if there is no delay in reporting then they give four weeks time otherwise if there is a delay in reporting i mean four quarters time otherwise you are supposed to be making payment immediately finalization of the audited financial statement towards the end of the due dates this again is something which uh, uh, we have been noticing all of us has been seeing clients coming to the last day i am not saying all of them are indulging into the fraudulent activity but when you are sitting on the other side at the bank side you should also be looking at that why is it that the borrower is only able to be submitting the financial statement uh, or <coughs> 
may be close to the year end and as a auditor i must also uh, tell you that what is happening is that the borrower keeps writing letter to the bank the bank keeps asking the letter to submit the audited financial statement he will write saying is that no my audit is not yet completed the fellow will keep writing even till 30th september also but when the balance sheet is presented it is dated maybe the august or september first week because of the uh, due date uh, i mean the number of days notice which is to be given so we as an auditor should also be very very careful when we are doing the audit on the other side and particularly when the caro has uh, the new caro 2020 has come in where it cast onerous obligation on us on reporting on the submiss stock i mean the statements which have been submitted to the bank so maybe since that is not something which is in a matter of uh, discussion here so i'll leave that aside i'll go to the next point which is the boiler plate disclosure now many of the balance sheet will re reproduce the disclosure requirement as given in the accounting standard as it is that again gives uh, some indication that there are controls which are lacking or the company does not have proper people who are able to understand what is required to be done delay in submission of the monthly statement stock statement that i think all of us are aware i did not elaborate on this search survey by the wet gst authority this also is one of the important consideration when uh, uh, <coughs> when we are looking at an borrower's account we should also keep this in mind that when the wet or gst authorities or uh, has carried out a search then there uh, there could be something either maybe the sales is uh, inflated or there could be something on the purchase side okay so that again calls for extra uh, care when we are uh, examining that particular borrower's account okay. then few of the signals uh, which we can uh, capture from the stock statements or the stock auditor's report now stock statements are being given on a regular basis by the borrower but the, as you know the stock statement only has a few categories you have a raw material you have wip you have finished goods and you have receivables details thereof are not being given now <clears throat> uh, wherever the details which are have been asked by the stock auditor uh, in a soft copy in excel or something so that the stock auditor is able to do the analysis and those copies have not been provided and the stock auditor has highlighted this then that is again one of the signals which i think we should uh, keep in mind that there could be something fishy in this particular account otherwise there is no reason why he has not been able to provide uh, detailed stock statement or book date statement uh, of the borrower inability to verify the stock by the stock auditor now this is something so most of these uh, signals or whatever i am discussing uh, the question is whether the bank management is able to deal with uh, detect it in most of the cases unfortunately that the answer is no because as we know that these things uh, the operational matters are being linked by uh, being, being attended by the officers at maybe at a junior level so and they do not have a sufficient experience in terms of not the banking experience but some sufficient experience in terms of how the borrowers have been operating so the, unfortunately because of that they have not been able to uh, maybe uh, detect uh, the frauds in time now inability to verify the stock by the stock auditor so this is something which is a very innocuous statement which sometimes the stock auditor makes so i i'll give you one uh, example here in mumbai where we came across so we were there as a uh, central statutory auditor of the bank so when we were going through the stock uh, audit reports of the uh, stock audit reports done in the branch uh, branches under that particular zone we find that there have been multiple uh, cases where the stock auditor could not verify the stock so we actually uh, keep those all those reports aside that why is it that the stock auditor has not been able to identify i mean uh, uh, carry out the physical verification of the stock and then uh, 
so uh, uh, as you may be aware in the central scheduled audit you deal with large number of branches so let's say there was uh, two three hundred branches in that so different people were looking at that so when we keep aside everything and when we started looking at uh, those reports we realized that all these uh, people uh, where they have not been able to verify the stock are in a particular area the address was uh, i will not say the address was common but the building was common so it was in sector 17 wasi so that's something which we found it it is very very strange so then we did little more exercise and we asked the bank management to go and verify the stock simultaneously at all the places and what happened is when they went there they went they realized that it was only one uh, uh, one office where the borrower has taken the loan from the different in different names he has taken loan in the name of his employee. He has taken loan in the name of his uh, uh, peon and small, small amount of loans. It was not a very large amount of loan. It was a loan was maybe about 25, 30 lakhs. So those kind of loans the guy has taken so that it did not go for a large scrutiny. But he took about 8, 10 loans uh, uh, from the same stock from the same uh, people. So every time what was happening is the guy has made... Uh, one uh, the, the, these so whenever you go for the inspection you will have to see that whether this uh, uh, your nameplate is there or not so the guy has made the nameplate of all these branches so whenever we with and most of the time what happens is we also go or the borrower goes um, usko inform karke jate hai, ke hai. Zara, isto, aap dukan khula hai na ya, ya office khula hai, khol ke rakhna, chai pane, which actually was not able the fellow had got sufficient time and because there was no uh, sudden inspection he, he could never get caught so uh, this inability to verify the stock uh, by the uh, if there is a comment like that by the stock auditor i think we as a branch statutory auditor should also be looking at uh, and taking this as a uh, uh, signal and see if there are other uh, signals which are present then maybe we need to take a call appropriately storage of stocks at own warehouse and third party warehouse also can uh, be one of the indicators see what <clears throat> so i i i i'll give you an uh, example so uh, maybe di digressing from uh, this this it has nothing to do with the own warehouse but the third party warehouse but okay first let me deal with so own warehouse and third party warehouse when we go so mixing of the somebody else's stock in the third party warehouse is also there because what happens is in third party warehouse if the 20 people was kept the stock those 20 people may or may not be related directly in this but they may be working in tandem so the probability of something going wrong in a, a, a borrower is more where the, the stock is being uh, kept as a third party warehouse but I'll, I'll just give an example on the warehouse so in one of the uh, large borrowers account <coughs> the borrower was submitting the stock statement uh, regularly and while there was nothing wrong in the stock statement but based on one of some of the indicators which we discussed we we, we felt that there is something uh, appears to be fishy in this account so we said boss ka, iska jara go down kaha, kaha pe, uska detail so he asked for the details of the go down because generally go down ka detail usko dena hota hai where all the stocks have been uh, kept but generally most of the people don't give the uh, location of the go down where the stock have been kept stock statement so we asked the bank branch to get the uh, details of the uh, these go downs where all he has kept the uh, stock so he go, uh, furnished the detail we also asked them that kindly he asked for the uh, area and since when these go downs have been occupied by them now they did uh, uh, submitted the area <coughs> what we did is the <coughs> the fellow was into the agricultural commodities so what we did is uh, there is I, I don't remember the name of the site but if you do google you will be able to finalize it in fact there is a, a government of india site also there is a separate organization which deals with the warehousing so there is a guidelines how you should be doing the warehousing and every material has certain velocity so if you have on a let us say 5000 square feet uh, go down what is the maximum storage you can theoretically have you, if somebody is supposed to be doing let us say 100 uh, uh, utilization 
so what is the maximum stock you can keep in uh, 5000 square feet godown so we did some calculation based on that calculation we realized that the stock is inflated with more than 100 times because the stock the fellow was uh, uh, disclosing regularly was all over required uh, go down of more than 100 times of the size which the fellow was already uh, actually having so we classify we uh, uh, term that account as a red flag uh, red flag account and then subsequently when the bank went for the forensic audit it turned out to be a uh, uh, fraud which is uh, as i was saying the database of the uh, different warehousing and the capacity of warehouses then this is something which we should be performing when we are doing uh, uh, when we look at the stock statement so they are supposed to be providing that uh, statement of debtors and creditors also so we generally do uh, 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 limited due diligence when i say due diligence is not in that sense so we take the tent of uh, large borrowers uh, i mean receivables or payables of the borrower and see how those trends have been in the last 12 months whether there is a similar trend or the trend is different and depending on uh, uh, whether the, uh, the fellow is let us say uh, <coughs> private limited company or limited company or llp we try to maybe one or two download the uh, financial statement of the, the that particular receivable just see whether how does that fellow balance sheet looks like if we have doubt if we oh, have sir. some doubt on the examination of these one two then we expand this uh, download most of it and then we ask the bank that you kindly ask the how the borrower has done the assessment of his receivables because you also have to understand we also know that no businessman is going to take undue risk in granting credit uh, to his customers unless he has uh, 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 means to repay so i did one uh, forensic audit of course this is not the uh, branch audit so very recently i did one forensic audit and i came to know that uh, when i do we did the forensic audit the fellow is supposed to be receiving about 175 crore from one uh, customer and when we went and checked that customer's financial the fellow has been dealing only with this he is not dealing with anybody else and he also is supposed to be receiving similar amount from somebody else so this was a clear out and out fraud now when we inquired from the bank's management because when the guy has been selling to only one guy i mean it is disproportionately the 30 percent 40 percent of the turnover is coming only from one guy why you didn't uh, ask for the information okay <clears throat> so that kind of an analysis whether bank should be doing bank uh, don't do that for multiple reasons as i said in the beginning one is the time second is the capability both I am not saying in every uh, 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 every fraud there is a connivance, but many of the times it is either the ignorance or maybe the haste with which they are working is something which leads to the fraud. I think concentration I already discussed. Wide variation purchase and sale from month to month. This also can uh, uh, be a uh, useful signal to see if there has been very wide fluctuations in purchase sale from uh, these two these parties. <clears throat> the director's KMP, I think I have already said that we also look at uh, from the publicly available information. I'm sure we all are aware that this Toffler, Insta Financials, or Zoaba Corp gives instant information that too free of cost. In MCA, probably, no, MCA, knowing the list of director, you don't have to pay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this also we try to look at whether there is a related party or not, and then whether if the, their association with other companies also we look at it. These are few of the things which we uh, uh, observe while going through the C, uh, their current account or the CC uh, account. <coughs> now, uh, every bank is required to particularly, so if you are doing a, a audit of a uh, borrower, I mean audit of a bank, bank where the borrower is solely banking with the, uh, that branch, then it doesn't have a challenge. But Many times you find that the borrower has also been dealing with various other banks. Some of them uh, may be under the multiple banking arrangement. 
and uh, maybe the consortium arrangement. So earlier we did not have the practice of getting the statement of account of the other uh, bankers. Now uh, we are able to get the statement of account of the other bankers also. So banks are supposed to be sharing that on a periodical basis amongst each other. So we generally uh, do the analysis of uh, their current account or CC account statement of the other banks. Now these things we do it not that this is a starting point again. I'm uh, coming back. We do it only in cases where we have been able to identify the early warning signals from the previous two slides. So the first starting point is whether it has been SMA 1 SMA 2. If it is SMA 1 SMA 2 then we look at okay these are the things whether the, some of these things are present in the borrowers financials if yes then probably we try to uh, do little deep go a little deeper into it which is analysis of their as i said uh, other banks account statements then now with the gst coming in so we have been requesting the banks that they should ask for the uh, borrowers uh, uh, GST statement go GST one GSTR one as well as the two way now GSTR one will have the your the customers information GSTR two way will have your suppliers information and then we just try to link it with their stock uh, stock statements that whether those kind of an, uh, one sell uh, those kind of sales which are getting reflected in GSTR one is there in the uh, stock statement or not and which is most important is the receivables which are being shown the list which is given to the bank is the same which is appearing in our GSTR one similarly on the purchase side also we uh, the way we look at it for two things one the LC which, which has been op uh, opened in in favor of the suppliers whether those kind of suppliers those suppliers are existing in our GSTR 2A or not and second of course the total uh, amount of purchases which has been shown uh, uh, in a two way i am not saying it need to reconcile we also need to be mindful of the fact that uh, one is only b2b so there could be b2c transaction which is not getting captured for that you can always ask for the 3b or uh, uh, <coughs> a 2a is not something which will be there because it is only uh, your b2b transaction and there is always going to be mismatch in terms of the time the fellow dispatches the time i recognize and i mean we are all aware what kind of issues one is facing in gstr 2a but that can give you a good guiding indicator that whether there exists some problem or not then own account payment from the data we will be a bill to bill so this also has been a good indicator we have been experiencing so somebody who has been making payment on uh, uh, own account or let us uh, uh, i mean not on account bill to bill payment or let us say multiple bills payment at one time I, as against a borrower uh, i mean borrowers customer who has been making an ad hoc payment and if those kind of uh, people who are making ad hoc payment on the uh, is more than the people who are making this then that gives an uh, indication that no this is something why is it that the uh, uh, customers are not able to settle on a bill to bill so is there any issue in terms of whether the bills has been uh, the, the, uh, i mean the value which has been disclosed in the bills is correct or not so those kind of things probably we need to be looking at it frequency of payment from the debtors so this is again when we look at the statement uh, so how frequently so again i'm saying i'm restricting this to the top 10 debtors only i mean I, again and again i'm repeating that it is not we are not supposed to be doing forensic audit so we are not supposed to be doing number one for all of them and so we do it for the limited set and that too if we come across that no there is something based on the earlier indicator there is something which we need to be looking at borrowing from high cost providers so this again is one of the uh, indicators so if somebody has been borrowing uh, from nbfc's or has been taking personal loan or there has been uh, the large number of credit cards with regular outstanding dues indicates that the fellow is in stress and as i said in the beginning it is the need we strive people to indulge into the fraudulent activity so the probability of somebody indulging into a fraudulent activity is more if he is into a financial stress 
lump sum payment to the creditor similar to the one which we discussed for our receivable so if the uh, uh, borrower is not making payment uh, to the creditor on a bill to bill basis that again is a uh, indicator that why is it not that he is able to settle on a uh, invoice to invoice basis long outstanding bills for collection so this is something which uh, in uh, banks you might be seeing that uh, when the bills are being sent for collection since bank has not advanced any money against that bank is not bothered about that so that just don't uh, is it boss it mera paisa thodi laga yaar borrow borrower ne bheja hai jab realize ho jayega to de dunga nahi realize hua to nahi dunga now something which has been long outstanding and no action is being taken so that indicates that either the borrower has raised a bill which is uh, fictitious or the payment has been realized but the borrower has not been following uh, has been realized maybe through different means and borrower that's the reason the borrower is not following or if the borrower is following and the payment is not coming then whether this is something which is an doubtful debt against which the dp can be granted or not so that's something which again is a good indicator analysis of the statutory payment now i am not referring to the payment uh, in time of course payment as is required to be made in time but the analysis also we do it uh, uh, that payment of the pif or esic or gst on a month to month basis how it has been fluctuating whether these payments are in line with the, uh, the sales which is being projected on a month to month basis whether there is a trend which is uh, visible if the trend is not visible then again uh, we pick up uh, maybe uh, the case for maybe little more further scope if anybody has any question we can raise the question uh, then and there huh? so these are the few issues which uh, uh, we have come across while uh, looking at the lc issued and lc discounted issue of the lc though there is no such trade practice so to give an example see the lcs are prevalent only in the very large organizations or if it is in a import export transactions so generally the lc is not something which is prevalent in every kind of an a trade so if let us say if your borrower is a uh, food grain merchant there is no practice of issuing lc and if the fellow has been uh, asking for the lc or he has been opening the lc uh, then that gives an indication that this could be a accommodation lc the borrower has been using this to raise funds against that lc so <coughs> time gap between the lc opening and discounting this again is a very very important thing and i i'll take both the next point together and i'll give one practical instance which we came across lc documents time gap between lr rr date and the acceptance of the document by the customer so what happens is when you are opening the uh, lc so lc being is being opened in the name of the uh, uh, bank beneficiary is the supplier so uh, there is a process it goes to the bank bank then advises to the supplier and then based on that i'll see the sup uh, supplier is supposed to be dispensing the goods and then obviously it has to either tra tra get transported by the either the road or by the rail and then you have the lr for that lr or rr for that and then finally you receive uh, at the uh, customers go down now in one particular instance which was sma2 account so what we uh, noticed is that there has been a regular movement regular lc dis uh, getting discounted and that too closer to the account which it can turn to an, an npa so maybe after 75 days 80 days 85 days 90 days so after sma2 these kind of activities were going on and when you look at it you find that all the documents are there in place <laughs> then we did little uh, maybe maybe a little more deep diving we said was when was the lc opened when did the lc request received so let us say he says it was received today when was the lc opened same day when was the lc advised same day when was the goods dispatched same day 
when did you get the goods next day when did you discount the lc next day now lc has got opened today got discounted next day <coughs> if you look at it in routine there there is nothing which you can doubt but if you take all these things together you find that this is something which is very very practical so the example which i am giving you is the <coughs> Uh, I will not uh, give the exact description of the uh, material. So it was a material relating to the iron and steel. 250 metric ton of an iron and steel has left from Ankleswar, reached Mumbai on the next day. And with one ally. Now I said, Baba, which is the truck who has the capacity to carry 250 ton? There is no truck which has a capacity to carry 250 ton material and that too even if you have let us say use uh, five trailers together then it cannot come in a day. So when uh, we we raise this point the banker also realized that it was a good thing. So based on that whatever those uh, LCs which were discounted we saw there was a pattern in this. Next day the, the LC gets discounted. The <coughs> parties were not one. I mean the supplier was not one, but there were two, three suppliers in whose name the LCs were being opened. But then immediately after the LC is getting opened, then the money is uh, I mean uh, the LC is discounted. Now LC discount money should go to the supplier, but that money gets rooted and comes back to the the bank who has opened the LC, the accounts get recognized. So these uh, this could be another signal and particularly uh, in non-fund based facility this is something which I feel is maybe quite prevalent because a lot of people are getting into the accommodation LC. So which is what I said carrying capacity of the mode of transport and then uh, of course EI bill to be not fully functional. Then transportation of goods by own vehicles. So this also is something uh, which uh, can be looked at a little differently. So again, I'll give you an example in one of the client in Ahmedabad who was into <coughs> furnace oil. The fellow used to uh, all uh, I said boss is ka ye ka hai, LR ka hai, nahi sir, mein uska khud ka truck hai. I said boss kitna truck hai uske paas mein fix a set register mein to dikhta nahi hai itna truck. And if this is the way the fellow is supposed to be transporting, I don't see any reason why if it is in a letter set uh, uh, transporter generally somebody who is using maybe reliance kind of on a thing who need 10,000 truck they might have it uh, on their own they will also not have it so because of this reason when we uh, dug little deeper we found it was nice with the both are issue so what I'm saying is I'm not saying just because somebody is using own vehicle the account is fraud no but that could be one of the indicators to maybe dig a little deeper. Chintan Bhai, how much more time I have? Sir, we have Chintan 45 Bhai. minutes more. 45 minutes. 45 minutes, sir. I have 40. Okay. Sir, I have to ask you one more question. Okay, take it. We can, sir, we, can, we can wind up early. That is not an issue. <laughs> Maximum is that. We can have questions also. Ah, also. Ah, numbers. Ah, no, no I, I, I have maybe I'll deal with another two, three slides. Okay. No problems. So sign signals emanating from the financial statements. <clears throat> now, uh, significant movement in inventory, which is not in sync with uh, uh, your turnover. So the turnover, let us say the increase is 10%, but you find that the increase in the inventory is uh, maybe 20% or 30%. So something which is disproportionate to the uh, turnover is, uh, is one part. Second part is whether the inventory levels in the industry is also similar to the inventory levels what is being there in the, in the case of this particular borrower. So what what happens is generally with everybody the large industries particularly nowadays talking about just in time inventory. Now when we talk about just in time inventory and everybody is saying that I keep inventory for a week 10 days but when it comes to the stock statement or when it comes to the bank borrowing 
you still go with two months of uh, raw material three months of uh, finished wood this kind of i mean in the today scenario these are something which is uh, unheard of unless you are into a seasonal industry see if you are into a uh, let us say sugar manufacturer or sugar sugar mill you can have maybe six months stock but if you are uh, not into any kind of an, a seasonal industry and if somebody is saying that no i have two months of an, a finished stock it's something which i think we should be looking at uh, 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 maybe a bit differently uh, and uh, the, the thing we should be doing a little more uh, exercise because this is not something which is very very uh, prevalent and practical increase in borrowing despite huge cash and cash equivalent in the borrower's balance sheet this again has been uh, seen in many cases that Though there is a cash and cash equivalent which is there in the bank's balance sheet, the fellow has been regularly increasing his borrowing. Now, generally, no sane businessman will do that because borrowing is always at a cost which is higher than the money at which you are able to deploy. Okay, so the reason why it is that when the the cash and cash equivalent is there and the fellow is still borrowing is something which we need to ascertain. And if the reason which we find is uh, I am not. I am not saying you cannot have it because the fellow may be trying for, let us say, some capex, huge capex for which the fellow may be borrowing. But that again could be one of the indicator that why the fellow is having so much of an a cash and still uh, keep on borrowing. Review of contingent liabilities again can give uh, uh, a good uh, <coughs> signal. So particularly when I am saying review of the contingent liability, this is something which is a grey area, particularly in the corporate. Unlike in the bank, where every transactions get recorded, in the case of the uh, corporate, uh, the transactions which are off balance sheet does not get recorded. So that is something which is very very important when we are going to be looking at the contingent liability. So two things: one. The uh, first thing what we need to be uh, looking at is the guarantees which has been issued by the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the our borrower. So logically, they are supposed to be disclosing that in the contingent liabilities. Now, those contingent uh, uh, liabilities, if you look at it, then we also will know that okay, boss, kiska kyo guarantee ki apne diya hai, konsa jo hai apka, whether they are related party, other is unrelated party ka to dega nahi whether those related parties has been disclosed to the bank as a related parties are not also is supposed to be looking at and more so your contingent liabilities arising from indirect tax matters now indirect tax matters why only indirect tax matters so indirect tax matters is something which is directly linked to the bank because in indirect tax matters it is either relating to the sales or it is relating to the purchase and bank is financing based on the receivables or the stock which is again linked to the sale or the purchase so that is something which we should be also be looking at uh, very very carefully to see whether there is an any any indication that the account can get impaired This is something which is from the uh, uh, operations. So this we can see it from the bank's books of accounts only. There has been frequent instances of dishonor of checks. Now that indicates number one, the borrower is in a financially indisciplined. He just keep on issuing the check without ensuring there is a sufficient balance in the account. Second thing that also indicates that the fellow is in a severe financial distress because though the borrower mangne ko uska uh, supplier mangne ko aa check to de diya lekin dishonor ho gaya so this is something which should be uh, again could be one of the indicator uh, <coughs> then frequent irregularities in the operating account which i already said uh, though we are going to be looking at sma1 sma2 now what can happen is in SMA 1, SMA 2, your term loan facility might get reported and your operating account, operating account the fellow uh, might not have uh, reached to let us say SMA 1 category. But if there has been frequent irregularities or overdrawings or the TOD which has been uh, granted or there has been frequent requests for the adobe or bill purchase or check purchase, those kind of things which are uh, 
happening on a frequent basis then that is again one of the indicators whether uh, we should be doing some more uh, procedures to see whether there exists a possibility of material misstatement in terms of non classification of the account as NPA. Delay in payment of the statutory dues that we everybody is aware, so we can leave that aside. Devolvement of LC, I think uh, all of us are aware what is to be uh, done. Invocation of the BG is also something which actually devolvement of the LC we have been looking at, uh, but invocation of BG is something which I have seen that many a times we don't pay the attention which it deserves. So invocation of the guarantee is something which is generally rare. It doesn't happen uh, very frequently in the case of most of the borrowers. So that is something if there is an invocation of the guarantee that should be that itself uh, could be the single biggest reason why the borrower's account should be maybe scrutinized more in detail because nobody is going to invoke the bank guarantee just like that unless adequate opportunity has been given to rectify or maybe to extend all those things are there then only the invocation can happen and <laughs> non-payment of income tax okay. this I'll tell you one interesting case I came across okay. so the fellow has been filing uh, tax returns has been disclosing uh, taxable income has been filing tax return and in tax return he has been showing that he has paid tax but there is no payment which has been made in the books of account it is appearing that the tax payable in it is just not appearing as tax has been paid so that was the only reason we could uh, uh, select one account he was isme kushto problem hai. because when in looked at that a huge amount of tax payable is appearing in this and when we looked at the income tax return as for the income tax return acknowledgement usme to sara tax payable pay, paid hai. So, a payable can't share. So, we started with that, and then finally, based on all other signals, we could uh, conclude that well, this is a red flag uh, account. All these I am uh, sharing the practical experience which we have come across while doing the stat uh, audit. Uh, now, the, uh, as I said in the uh, beginning, RBI has come up with the 42 signals. Now that, if you want me to go through each one of them, I can go through that. Otherwise, I will leave that on the table. People can the circular is there and uh, there is nothing more I have to add on that. And most of it which is relevant for this we have already covered. So these are the 42 uh, signals which RBI has uh, listed out. Maybe I will quickly go uh, one by one just read the heading. Bouncing of the high value checks. Foreign bill discounting. Delay in payment of outstanding dues. Frequent development of LCBG. This I have covered. Under our insured inventory. This could also be one of the uh, reasons. I missed it. So insurance is sometimes an indicator. That if you are declaring the stock of let us say 100 crores and you have insurance of only 20 crores so that could also be one of the reasons to maybe do little more deep diving in the account to see whether uh, whatever is being disclosed appears to be reasonable or normal you know you say duet of 10 pan funding of the interest by sanctioning additional facility frequent request for general purpose loan frequent ad hoc sanctions Heavy cash withdrawal in the loan account, significant increase in the working capital borrowing as a percentage of turnover, in merchanting trade, import leg like note revealed to the bank, concealment of certain vital documents like master agreement, insurance coverage, frequent changes in the accounting period and or accounting policy. So accounting period of course is now not possible but accounting policy is yes. Claims not acknowledged as debt as high substantial increase in the unbuilt revenue year after year more relevant in the case of our uh, infrastructure projects material discrepancies in the annual report significant uh, inconsistencies within the annual report 
poor disclosure uh, of material uh, materially adverse information and no qualification by the statutory auditors frequent change in the scope of the project to be undertaken by the borrower sales proceeds are not routed to the consortium uh, member or the lender bank high value rtgs payment to unrelated party increase in the borrowing despite use cash and cash equivalent this we discussed dispute on title of the collateral security request received from the borrower to postpone inspection of the godown exclusive collateral charge to a number of lenders critical issues highlighted in the stock audit report non production of the original bills for verification significant movement in the inventory disproportionate differing in the change in the turnover significant movement in the receivables increase in the fixed asset without increase in the long term resources posting of the project which is greatly in variance with the standard post funds coming from other banks to liquidate the outstanding loan floating interest uh, floating front associate companies by investing borrowed entity so these are the list which has been given what i have done is so apart from the list so, so what is the uh, control which bank should have whether preventive control or the directive control and what kind of an audit process we as a auditor should be uh, having now the i then the last i have just summarized this what uh, the the frauds which has been happening if you look at it 59% of the frauds have been taken uh, place because of the involvement of the employees and 41% has been with uh, by the customers now in this uh, maybe the presentation i have covered mainly relating to the advances the frauds are as i said uh, the large number of frauds not value of fraud large number of frauds do take place particularly around the uh, customers account which is mainly perpetrated maybe by the third party not by the depositor or the borrower so that i am not covering another fraud which is there in the uh, uh, has been there particularly in in the banks on the housing loan portfolio maybe if i can just touch upon that what is happening in the housing loan portfolio is so at the time of uh, the sanction of the loan there has been documents which has been fraudulent documents which has been uh, produced or there has been instances where the property has been substantially uh, overvalued so uh, <coughs> uh, and after a payment of one installment because particularly nowadays the cash component is not there in the property transactions and if the bank is going to be funding 80% of uh, the loan in today's uh, scenario getting proper valuation done by the valuer which is let us say from the actual uh, instead of 2 crore value the property getting 3 crore is not very difficult and based on 3 crore the bank is going to be lending let us say 2.4 crores whereas the actual value is only 2, two crores so these kind of uh, uh, transactions or frauds has been very prevalent particularly on the housing loan portfolio where because of the uh, inflated valuation and subsequently borrower has defaulted the number of uh, frauds in terms of uh, forced documents has come down substantially but this is something which is still very very rampant having said that i think i have come to an end of my uh, presentation i will be too glad to answer your uh, queries if you have any members who have any questions are requested to post it through the chat so that learned speaker can answer those queries. Yeah, is my chat guy, yar. Sir, chat here, sir. I'm sorry, Chindan, why I'm doing it for the first time. I have been using Zoom, so I know, but I don't know in this. No problem, sir. I'll I, 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 yeah. Sir, I'll share the chat. Let let those questions come. I'll share it with you. Yeah. Members, any questions are there?
one is you have mentioned during your presentation about sma1 and sme2 accounts can you explain what is it anjay ji ha ji hello there is a question you mentioned about sma1 and sme2 account can you explain what is it yeah so sma1 is special mention account so whenever the any uh, loan which becomes due which is uh, or let us say or due beyond 30 days it is to be classified as sma1 and any loan which is outstanding uh, which is or due beyond 60 days is to be classified as sma2 both these reporting are required to be made to the reserve bank of india on a uh, weekly basis and this is something which is being done not only uh, by let us say the branch which you are auditing but all across the bank and the bank has access to the entire database so this is true for all accounts where the outstanding is more than 5 crores i mean the borrowing limit is more than 5 crores not the outstanding so this information every bank will have it okay so the next question is yeah if the stock report does not have quantitative details so how it should be stock report does not have stock audit report does not have quantitative details details yeah. record is not maintained highlighted but the stock order then in such case is a branch order what conclusion we can draw from this so if the quantity if the stock auditor is not uh, is saying that the quantitative details have not been maintained or he is not able to comment on that that means he has not been able to physically verify the existence of the stock see so stock auditors report in the stock verification is two things one existence of the stock second is the valuation of the stock now maybe he is commenting only on the valuation of the stock he is not commenting on the existence of the stock now if the existence itself is in doubt valuation has no meaning so generally in such cases what we do is that goes if you do not have uh, the stock auditor's report which uh, i mean the stock auditor uh, says that he has not been able to verify we will not consider the value of inventory okay uh, sir one more question how to use rating agencies rating for fraud detection chintan bhai your voice is uh, breaking okay sir the rate, rating agency's rating can be useful for fraud detection now can you come back again sorry the rating ratings given by the rating agency how can it be used for fraud detection yeah so uh, rating done by the so if we know the uh, i mean i don't i should not be making any comment on the rating agency but the fact is that they have always been behind the curve if you look at the recent uh, recent uh, instance stage they have not been able to forewarn they have always been behind the curve as yes bank has a double a plus rating we, we should not forget that there have been instances where there has been lot of i am not trying to say, discard the rating all the time saying is that they have been behind the curve so uh, does it gives a comfort maybe yes to begin with but that's the can we draw comfort only from that the answer is maybe not we we should not uh, let our uh, guard i mean we should not go for guard or we should not let down our guards we should be careful as a auditor we can never say chintan bhai to the let us say the, whenever there is an issue to the regulator or the other investigating authority that i relied on the rating and sir uh, in terms of npa classification Yeah. one group company account is npa does the other group company becomes npa no definitely not the uh, classification is borrower wise but at the same time though it doesn't become npa we take that as an a uh, uh, warning signal because generally kya hoga promoter will try to save everything now there could be in a situation i am not saying that there could not be in a genuine situation there could be a genuine situation where one of the account has become npa but other companies are doing well so but at the same time that itself is in a very good indication that course we need to be looking this account maybe little more in detail 
so that it should not so happen that we have left any uh, checkbox uh, checkbox unticked uh Sir, one question. I think physical stock is lying in the go down. Yeah. Since quantity details are not available, so valuation is doubtful. Hence, DPT cannot be calculated. So, should CC account be blocked? So, what should be done? Should the CC account be blocked? Cash credit account be blocked? So, so blocking or not is in the hands of the bank. So, what as an auditor we should be doing? I can tell you. See, uh, yeah. <laughs> so in such case, if you have not been able to identify the, let us say the stock valuer has said that, you know, I could not verify the stock or I have no valuation I am not able to do. You consider the stock value to be zero for, for that particular go down and recompute the DP. If based on such recomputation yeah. of the DP, if the account is overdrawn, it will become NPA. If it is not overdrawn, this will remain standard. See, it is still possible that the fellow has all these things, but the fellow has not drawn the money. It is also possible. I think there are no more questions coming. So, sir, uh, thank you so much for the time and really yeah. appreciate. Thank you, and thanks everybody to organize. And thanks, thanks thank everybody for attending. It was a really great session and a really, you know, change of mind. We got in a thinking process from something different that has been going in our mind every day. Thank you, Sanjay for this wonderful session and thank you everybody for attending. Thanks, sir. And wish everybody, Thank you. I, I wish everyone to remain safe and uh, healthy during these challenging times. Thank you.